Welcome to another episode of the Essential Craftsman Podcast. I'm Nate. I've got my dad here, the Essential Craftsman. How are you Hi, doing? Guys. Good, man. We're doing something new this episode. We have a bunch of questions that have been submitted by listeners. These submissions happen on our website under essentialcraftsman.com slash podcast. So if you'd like to send a message, that's how you can do it. Now let's start at the bottom here. And the cool thing about this is you can hear the question directly from the listener. Hey guys, uh, this is Bobby McGinnis from uh, Springfield, Ohio. And uh, recently saw uh, Scott pull out some type of knife or multi-tool on the uh, chalk line for noobs video here recently. And uh, for whatever reason, I happen to be looking a lot into everyday carry knives here recently. And just curious, I'm like, oh, wonder what he's got there. Looks like something there. And I didn't know if you guys wanted to be able to shed more light on that. But uh, anyway, really appreciate everything you guys do and really enjoy your videos. Thank you so much. You want to go or you want me to go? Uh, you go first. So, Bob, it depends entirely on what your day-to-day -day routine is like. When I was in Wyoming, there was a period of time when I was working for an outfitter guiding elk hunters. I was never that good at it. But I would not. I would have carried a longer bladed knife with a lock feature. And so that would be the sh first part. It, the blade ought to lock or you're going to cut your fingers. But for me now, I use a Leatherman, and this is a Leatherman free. I just love it. Got all the capacity I need. I, it has gotten me out of a jam over and over. I carried Leatherman Wave for a long time, so that's the answer for me. What do you carry? So do you like the free more than the Wave? I'm I sure we'll do this deep dive at some point. But. I, I do. It, it It's a little softer in my hand when I'm really squeezing on the pliers. It's softer in my hand. It's kind of a yeah. one-handed operation, and... It feels to me like they've taken this as far as they can take it, but they'll probably pull another rabbit out of the hat, you know, eventually. For sure. Yeah, I would agree. I uh, I love carrying a multi-tool like a Leatherman. If there's any possibility, I'm going to be doing work on that day. A lot of times my day-to-day -day is more at a computer or running errands or something, in which case I just carry a pocket knife. Mm -hmm. And 95% of the time, that's all I need on you know, 80% of my days. So yeah. it's more elegant to me and I enjoy carrying it more. And, and, uh, if I, if I ever stumbled into a grizzly bear, that's what I'd want to have. So uh, yeah, that's, that's really what I'm uh, worried about. Hey, this is Patrick, uh, from Anchorage, Alaska and question for Scott. My question is Scott. Um, I just wondered, you know, you're an ex. it seems like you're an expert on the job site. Uh, have you ever lost your temper with, uh, you know, some, workers on the job site, maybe some apprentices. Um, does that happen a lot? Uh, you know, do you have a lot of people on the job site with short fuses? Uh, and how does that affect the, uh, the work getting done? I imagine that, uh, it, it can cause a problem if not everyone is uh, getting along and feel open to speak up and, um, ask questions and stuff like that. Thanks. Great question. So, the short answer is the way that it affects the morale or the atmosphere on the job is it turns when you have one or two or three guys with short tempers, it turns the atmosphere onto the job into sort of a junior high playground environment. It dumbs down the job. And I, I, I'm embarrassed to remember there have been maybe four or five. There've been a few times in the past that I've lost my temper on the job but not since I was a general contractor kind of controlling the site myself because if there's somebody with a short temper, they're only on my job once, just one time, and then they're working somewhere else, and I just try to put them out of my mind. Mm -hmm. But when I was an employee or a foreman or something, I was younger, and so there were, there were a few times, but it wasn't so much with an apprentice as with somebody who was, I don't know. That's probably enough said on that. A, a short temper on a job site wrecks the job site. Yeah, having a short temper in general would be a real challenge of a personality trait because when you lose your temper on somebody it's hard to you kind of change that to, it, to me at least it changes my relationship with that person yep kind of permanently it's not to say you can't still have one but if if you were a person who's prone to do that that would definitely be something to work on the, the metaphor i use is if there you may ha your neighbor may have a dog and you can tolerate that dog barking and you can tolerate that dog, dog tipping over your garbage can, but if he bites you one time, yeah. okay, now it's a new relationship. Yeah, exactly. Hi, guys. My question is how to get started, especially for someone like myself who 
um, has currently um, a desire for a career change. I have a family uh, as well. I'm in my late 20s. Um, so just wondering, what would you suggest to someone um, who's who's looking for a, t- a career change to probably get into the the GC uh, general contractor kind of environment? Um, how to get started? What steps to take? Um, I have a little bit of background in uh, remodeling and and in construction as well, um, and and I enjoy working uh, with my hands and and you know figuring and tinkering uh, on things. Uh, but just uh, how, how to get started? Okay, how to get started as a general contractor? In your late 20s, you got some exposure to trade work, craft work, then I would very deliberately take a couple classes or maybe online classes and learn something about record keeping and finance and how money works. I would learn something about, I would learn whatever you have to learn about how to um, develop, well, record keeping. Because that's a key part of business. If you can't keep track of where you're at as a general contractor, you never know where you're at. It's been my big weakness. My whole career as a general contractor, my weakness was being driven to do the work and not driven to keep track of the work, except to make sure the work got done. So that would be the first thing. The second thing would be maybe stop thinking about life as a general contractor and start thinking about life as a subcontractor because you're much more likely to experience success if you focus your attention on one thing and take it just as far as you can and train a payroll of guys that only have to do one thing. It's way easier than to have to accumulate guys that can do a lot of things and take your chances with a wide range of subcontractors. I think more subcontractors make more money than small to medium-sized general contractors. And that's probably because of the employee issue, I, I take yeah. it. Like, like in your business, how do you hire somebody who has to do 18 different tasks, you know, depending on what job is there at the moment, right? I, I never could. And since I couldn't replace me, I was stuck doing it with just me. Yeah. So th- that's what I would say is is narrow your focus, go deeper, and know more about business before you dive in. Yeah, that's great. Hello, Mr. Wadsworth. My name is Zachary. I'm a field engineer for a commercial construction company in Georgia. My question is, where do you draw the line between splitting hairs and good enough for government work? And over the length of your career, have you ever gotten into disagreements with other carpenters over degree of accuracy? Thank you. So, yes, I, I've gotten into disagreements about degree of accuracy when I was just a cog in the wheel, you know, part of a bigger outfit. Um, in retrospect, I don't know how many of those disagreements were significant enough to have been worth disagreeing over. But the first part of your question about drawing the line between splitting hairs and good enough for government work is that quality is only one of the considerations on a, on a big job. The other considerations are how much are two sides of the same coin, how long it takes and how much money is available to spend on it. And if you can't get the work done in the required amount of time, it almost doesn't matter how good the work is. Mm. And on the flip side, if you're getting the work done in the required amount of time, but it's rejected for poor quality, it doesn't really matter how fast or how inexpensively you did it. Mm. So uh, I think the answer to that is helping everyone on the job site who's teachable understand what the time and money budgets are and help them understand how to get the best quality they can inside those parameters. And then if somebody can't figure it out, they have to work somewhere else. Yeah. Um, you've said before on the channel, it's up to the person signing the check, you know, the the, the foreman or the mm-hmm. customer or whatever. But it's it's not always easy to find that person. No. And that person may not be the one, to, like with a, if you're remodeling some older lady's home, you yep. know, she may not, her opinion on that may not be, helpful. So yeah. it, it's it's not an easy question. That's probably why he's asking, you know. That's it's, right. it's really not an easy question. So he's a field engineer for commercial cr- construction. So partially where Zachary's coming from is that you've got the tradespeople in there and the management of the tradespeople and you get to the end and then the architect or the field engineer comes in and these guys have done work that they thought was fine yeah. and the field engineer is appalled because it doesn't hit the specification. Yeah. And then how do you how do you can you require people to tear something out that's not done according to standard practices and procedures and in a workmanlike manner? And how's that ambiguity answered? Yeah. And it's just hard, but you've got to have somebody on the job that has real attention to detail. And hopefully that person also understands production. And if you don't have that, 
you're behind day yeah, one. Yeah, and if you're working on the job, make as few assumptions as possible. So maybe this, the first time you have a a portion that's complete that somebody can look at, have them look at it and be like, I'm going to do this from now on unless you tell me otherwise. That's a great suggestion. All right, thanks, Zachary. Uh, thank you for giving us uh, a chance to send in uh, questions to you. I have a question. How do you find uh, studs uh, inside the wall uh, in situations where it is not as easy to find them as you would think? Say if there would be, for example, um, vertical panel, wooden panel in the house or if this house has plates on it and is built with a, uh, according to a different standard than uh, the ones we use today? Good question. No easy answer. Vertical wood panels are really tough. Um, so one thing, it's easy to get locked inside the room trying to figure out where the studs are. Maybe you have to go outside and see if there's some sort of an indicator on the outside, an, an outside switch box or some way. Maybe there, maybe... Maybe there are some vertical nailing lines in the siding on the outside of the house that'll tell you where the studs are. So you can do that. But really the only answer I can give you that's, that is not case by case dependent is buy the best darn digital stud finder you can find and practice on a set up a substrate that you think is similar to what you're dealing with. Put a board behind it, put the same thickness and type of um, surface over the top of it and see if you can find the board when you know where it's at. Then you know if you can trust your stud finder. In case some of you didn't catch that or don't don't know this, basically every outlet or switch in your home is fastened to a stud on one side or the other. Yep. So that's a that's a starting spot, and once you find one, maybe it's sixteen inches, but sometimes you can find some others, right? Yeah, that was his point that that an older house is not necessarily in a, a predictable sixteen inch pattern or twenty four inch pattern. Mm -hmm. It's like ah, you know, it's random. I just start making holes, Joaquin, <laughs> and don't look back, and then I yeah. hang my picture over top of all twenty eight <laughs> holes. Hi, Scott and Nate. Just wondering where or what is the meaning of the name sixteen penny nail or eight penny nail? Thanks. So the short answer is. I'm not clear enough on the historical details on that to answer that coherently, but I'm going to get familiar with it. And uh, how about this? A, a 16 penny nail is about three and a quarter inches long, sometimes three and a half, and an eight penny is around two and a quarter inches long. But I'll get back with you on the historical evolution about how many per per penny or how many per hundred weight. And I, I don't know, but we'll get back with you. It had to be related to cost yeah. and weight. Yeah to some extent. We got to figure that out. All right. Yeah. How you doing over there, Essential Craftsman? My name is Anthony Avila. I live in Yucaipa, California, and I need you to come down with your team <clears throat> and enclose a 48 square foot porch. I need to close that in, make it a little mud room. Anthony, there's nothing I would enjoy more than coming down to Yucaipa, California and meeting you and enclosing a 48-square-foot porch, but Nate would shoot me. I mean, he keeps me on that spec house. There's no slack. There's no let-up, and so sorry, man. Um, I can't help you, but I would love to. Hey, guys. Really appreciate all the great content. The video series is awesome. Podcast is great. Learning a lot of valuable information. A uh, question for you would be how a younger carpenter could go about learning from senior carpenters? Like, how do you find a mentor? What do you suggest? Who do you look for? How do you grow your network in terms of learning more complicated projects or learning the finer intricacies of the trade and learning how to be better at the skill set? I appreciate the help, guys. Have a good one. So that's a great question. And I guess the answer is probably the same way you kill a trophy bull elk. You hunt a lot. You hunt, you hunt, you hunt, you get ready, you practice your marksmanship, you make sure you understand where the elk are liable to be. So the, what I mean by that is you find some place where, where carpenters hang out, usually a lumber yard, a full service lumber yard, not a big box store. You talk to the person who's worked there the longest and say, who should I, who should I be talking to? You identify who those people are, and then you practice some intelligent questions because the only way they're going to invest in you is if you ask them a question that will somehow label you as somebody that they're that they're interested in investing in. So think about your questions. Don't waste their time. Ask them something that's going to cause them to think and cause them to think more appreciatively, perhaps, of you. 
Yeah, best case scenario would be work for somebody who you could learn a lot from because then you're going to be around them yep. more often. Yep. That would be ideal. That's not always yep. the case, but and, and so that 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 would be the the first thing I should have said, but you use the idea of finding the person before you go to work for them if you can. Yeah. Cuz once you got a job, you're stuck, right? And you can invest a lot of your formative years with somebody who's not going to either doesn't know anything or won't tell you anything. So you got to do some research on who you want to work for before you, before you jump on board with them. Finding a mentor is kind of a, we, we should talk more about that and maybe just think more about it. But I mean, in a perfect world, we would all have a mentor, you know, assigned to us, but you don't, everybody's not entitled to a mentor. You're lucky if you find one. I know maybe you've mentioned and certainly the way I've approached it is learning as much as you can from everybody. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of are in a habit of doing that sooner or later, you might find a person who can really get a lot. But if you can find a great mentor, that's great. But there's usually some things you can learn from just about everybody you cross paths with. For sure. And just one more thing on that is one thing you never want to respond. If you find somebody you think you can learn from, never say to them, oh, I know. Yeah, I know. No, I know. Yeah. Never say that. Just strike that from your vocabulary because that yeah. will shut off their interest in telling you anything. Yeah. So it's always, yeah, thanks. Great idea. Good call. Didn't know that. Yeah. Because you're not interested in proving to them what you know. You're interested in proving to them that you're ready to learn. This is more of just a how to have a helpful personality. But yeah. if somebody tells you something, like you said, even if you know it, just be grateful and enthusiastic yep. and oh neat as, and instead of like meanwhile okay you know just because yep. what happens is when a person shares something with you they get a little you know good feeling for like hey that's great i helped that person that's gonna incentivize them to maybe share you more things and and so that's a great that is a really great point don't don't you know slam your own foot in the door yeah <laughs> all right would you ever consider building a boat for your next uh, project on the YouTube channel? And um, just a couple of comments. Uh, recently did a re-roof, metal re-roof of my house. And two comments you make on your videos kept popping to my mind. That 80% of construction is moving materials. My back can attest to that. And when you say it's just work, I kept telling myself after I drove the 200th screw into the roof uh, over and over again. Uh, love the podcast and keep up the good work. So a great question. Would I ever consider building a boat? Yes. Would I ever consider building a boat with a camera running? No. Cy built a boat. How, whatever happened to that? Oh, yes, I did. Cy built a concrete hulled sailboat. And people say, what? Yes, a concrete hull is a legitimate construction technique on ocean-going ve vehicles. Vehicles? Wow. Uh, yeah, crafts. <laughs> vehicles, crafts. Thank you. And he, and it's a serious boat. It used to be, and I forget how long it was. I don't know, thirty-five feet or forty feet. And and uh, well, first time I drove up to his shop, here's this this boat, big, deep V hull, propped up right next to the entrance to his blacksmith shop. And I heard the story, and he intended to sail. He was thinking around the world, and then he thought maybe to Hawaii and back. And yeah. and then he so eff, efflorescence or effervescence efflorescence yeah. is salts and alkali crawling out of concrete, and it happens when concrete is or brickwork is done in a particular way. And he began to see efflorescence crawling out of the hull on his boat, and it rocked his faith in his construction process and he began to think he didn't want to go to the bottom in his concrete hulled boat so it just sat there and a few years ago he walked his excavator up there dug a hole in the back behind his shop drug his sailboat out pulled the i don't know i think he had two thousand pounds of lead in the hull for ballast wow drug that out took the wheel out took a desk out where he was going to do his dead reckoning for sailing oh my god crushed it up tamped it into the hole and buried it. I was going to say, he should have buried it and turned it into a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No so kidding. not only can, is Cy, you know, handy and can do anything, but he's also smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he identified a boat as a very expensive hole in the water. Yeah. yeah. Evening, gents. Uh, my name is Barry. I am a, uh, I guess, a construction worker. This is like my first month on the job. Uh, as a soon-to-be apprentice electrician, and uh, as a younger guy who likes fitness and likes to cook, likes <laughs> really likes to eat, 
Um, I've always been curious, especially after your recent episode about health, what sort of foods or snacks or, uh, you know, what is, what's that pleasure bit of, well, sustenance that really keeps you going or that helped you through some of the harder jobs that you've done, uh, during your life? You know, was it bread and cheese? Was it a snack bar? Was it cereal or jerky? Um, and what kind of drinks? Uh, I'd love to know more about it to get some better ideas to help me uh, through my uh, first few years in construction. We are terrible at this. We are <laughs> not the people to ask, but go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, Nate's right. Barry, I know nothing. I know nothing. I know this. For the first 20 years I worked construction, my wife made a lunch for me every single day, and I was very appreciative. Now, there's nothing, anyhow, a lunch that sits in the truck in Las Vegas in the summer gets to be hard to eat, but mm -hmm. but lunches are great, right? But I, I don't know. Sometimes when I'm having a fit of, of uh, culinary responsibility, I will eat a package of almonds for lunch. But for a lot of the time, when I first moved back to Oregon, I've got to tell you about Umpqua Dairy. So we have a local dairy here, mm -hmm. and uh, it is... It, it goes to the World Dairyman's Competition and wins world's best at a lot of things, they say. And their Umpqua Dairy Dutch-style chocolate milk is the best on the planet. I will, I will throw down it's the best on the planet. And I used to drink a quart for lunch. Bam. I could drink that in 15 seconds. I've got two pounds of sustenance in my belly. It tasted delicious. It gives me energy. It burns off. Uh, and I don't do that anymore. I, it just made me too fat. Well, but now you drink a pint. Now I drink a pint occasionally. Okay. But Barry, anything I tell you about this is worthless. So thanks for the question, but you're going to have to figure that out, man. Ban bananas are really good. They come in their own case, like some comedian said. And sometimes I'll leave the house if we have fresh ones with like three or four, just because you don't have to feel guilty about eating a lot of bananas and they, it's you know, true. there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mass there, but man, it's really tough. I mean, fast food, I'm sorry, construction workers eat fast food notoriously because it's fast because it's fast and it's, you know, relatively fresh, you know, mm -hmm. fresher than it may have been if you made a sandwich, who has time to even make a sandwich? If you're lucky to have someone help you make a sandwich, yeah. like I said, we're, we're really terrible at this. We're so. terrible. Nuts, uh, sunflower seeds, bananas and fruit. If you can, carry fruit you know fruit is great actually because i guess oranges and apples are all pretty durable on a truck seat also they are yeah. but I, I don't know it's uh, still it's still tough we, we struggle with this so i'll say this um during the periods of time that i eat a lot of almonds my next health checkup seems to result in lower blood pressure yeah. i don't know if that's because of the almonds or because i've lost a little weight but barry i i don't know the main thing is for me, it was always a function of time. Yeah. Bulk food stores are a good place where that you can buy like almonds or nuts or what I've bought recently is wasabi peas, which are also relatively not bad for you compared to the alternative. But anyways, bulk food places where you can buy those things, not prepackaged, is a lot less expensive. That's the downside of nuts and jerky. I mean, I would They're eat jerky expensive. every meal, every day, but who could afford that? That's right. Um, but if, if you can, you know. All right, thanks, Barry. Great voice, by the way. Very yeah. dramatic. That's just beautiful voice. I hope you sing in a choir somewhere, man. You've got a bass voice to die for. Where are the connections and how you can connect uh, the trades of blacksmithing and other crafts such as carpentry and woodworking? And how do you connect to them? Like basically one uniform craft Octavius Beanie. Okay, yeah. Octavius Beanie, I think you're looking for the grand unifying theory of craftsmanship, and it has not been discovered yet. But usually it's easier to get into some kind of woodworking, you know, at sort of an entry level. Carpentry is fairly easy to get into at an entry level. I mean, we can all build a birdhouse, and then we can all move forward until we build a table. And so, and it's all the same. If you're learning to work with your hands and you're learning to appreciate tools, once you start anywhere, your interest is going to take you where you want to go. So the connection is you're making things, you're visualizing things, you're doing work, you're getting cuts and scrapes and burns. It's all the same. It's all great. Yeah. And I don't know if this was a part of your question, but there, there's not actually a big overlap between blacksmithing and woodworking in terms of career. In other words, don't, right. e don't expect to pick up blacksmithing and you know combine it with 
jewelry make jewelry box making and and create some awesome income for yep. you and your family. There's there's not a lot of overlap there. Blacksmithing is pr- primarily hobby and you know personal personal satisfaction. Yep. The bonus is there are places like maybe in uh, structures. You've made a lot of uh, structural iron work. Mm-hmm. That that maybe is a place where there is some commercial overlap, but yeah. it's a, kind of a small zone. Yeah, Nate, thanks for that moment of clarity, Octavius. If that's what you're asking. The connection between blacksmithing, carpentry, and woodworking is get some kind of an education, learn to do something you can be well paid for, and then pick up any of these sorts of things that interest you to do for satisfaction and enjoyment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's great. Sai's done well with that, not to bring him up every question, but in his house and in general, you know, and, and you have as well, but the blacksmith work can connect big pieces of mm-hmm. lumber together, even in tables and furniture, it, mm-hmm. it almost kind of creates connections that that then can feature the wood in new and different ways so yeah all right thanks octavius next question is from duke hello essential craftsman i love what you're doing with your channel and with your podcast i do have a suggestion though when encouraging these young men to join the trades and and to get doing things and building things i think we should take a second and teach these young gentlemen how to use a first aid kit or to even have a first aid kit. And if they have a first aid kit, what to do? Basic first aid, you know, everybody gets an owie and a boo-boo. Someone gets wild with a grinder. Someone gets wild with a hammer. What to do? Um, medical fixes. Uh, you can uh, do a preface of you're not a doctor, but this is what you've done on job sites before, your experience. Um, country remedies, uh, something like that just for content. It's a quick tabletop. You get to sit down and point at stuff. Uh, just a suggestion. Love your channel. Thank you for everything you great do. Idea. God bless you and yours. Yeah, great idea. I don't know yeah. how we've never done that. Why have we not done that? One of the reasons is because it's not my strong suit at all. It'd be more your strong suit with your scouting background, well, right? Yeah, but the basics, I think a lot of you, you know, and that that you have to be taught when you have a big cut, you know, t- direct pressure and yeah. tourniquets and yeah. elevating feet and keeping somebody warm if they're in shock and i, I yeah. don't know there are some very basics that if they fall don't move them until you yeah 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 yeah, yeah exactly um if, if you suspect a neck injury <laughs> isolate that so that, yeah. maybe, maybe we brush up on it but that's a great and even if we don't aren't fresh we should get fresh or bring someone bring in somebody in yeah yeah great idea S- that's a great idea so th- this introduces a couple things the most useful first aid product that i have in my truck is electrician's tape Nothing heals a cut like electrician's tape around there, two or three wraps. Don't get it too tight. You'll have a tourniquet, and your finger turns blue, and that's no good. Um, when you smash your finger with a hammer, you take a hot the end of a hot paper clip, and you'd kind of you melt through the fingernail until it gets to the blood before the blood coagulates, and it quenches, and it relieves the pressure. Is that for reals? That works great, yeah. But it takes – got to grit your teeth, okay? What the heck? And, and it's got to be a like, – like that that little black fingernail right there, there wasn't enough blood in it. It's got to be a real smash, and then the finger's throbbing because of the pressure in there between the nail and the nail bed, and you can, any kind of a blunt end of a wire, like a paper clip, heat it up in a candle till it's glowing, and just push it gently through the fingernail, and it smokes, and as soon as it gets to the blood, it's quenched, and that hole, it's not like drilling a hole that plugs up. Huh. It's just, you know, get this nice round hole, and it feels so much better. I don't know if this is sanctioned or not. We're going to qualify <laughs> this, uh, but it's possible. And uh, it works. It's it certainly, works. I, I get the concept of relieving pressure, but geez, just it, burning right through your finger now. Huh? It works great. Wow. It, I, I've done it with little bitty drill bits, but then you've got the fuzz of the fingernail and it the, it's always clotted and you've got to do it again. Crazy. So so the throbbing and the pain is kind of relieved because the pressure it is relieved? It feels so much better. Now you've wow. still got a smashed finger, but you don't have that, you don't feel every heartbeat, you know? Wow. So it works, it, it works better. The trick we talked about in one video about the best thing on a job for removing a piece of debris from your buddy's eye if he'll let you do it is the end of your carpenter pencil because it's perfectly smooth and perfectly round and the graphite's yeah. nice and clean i don't recommend you go doing that but if yeah. you just have to but so so that's a great suggestion to roll out a my limited experience with first aid kits is it's got all the junk in there that you don't need and the little pieces of gauze are not big enough to really stop anything yeah you know so yeah, but lots of times just having, if you make your own, I, I, I keep ibuprofen and Advil and mm-hmm. some of that kind of stuff, which I have dug in and grabbed sometimes. But, um, well, that's a great suggestion. And, you know, 
it should be mentioned, I've only been around a couple emergencies in my life that were sort of right then and there. But every time that's happened, it's after the initial, you know, shock and everybody helping, but it's just a, always a wake up call. Like, Oh yeah. my gosh, I, I, yeah. I'm not a couple times I was prepared, but in other times where you're not, you, you instantly think, how have I not imagined this happening? An example would be if someone is choking, you yeah. know, and like a kid, if your kid is choking and I've kind of freshened up on that, but that's the kind of thing that you, you want to have prepped before that moment. Cause you don't, yeah. you're not, you don't want to get your phone out and start Googling. What do I do if my kid <laughs> is choking? No, if you're a parent and, and even if you're not, that's something probably like what, what, what he's talking about here. Yeah. Great I, suggestion. I, I have a couple stories I'll share sometime of when I just, I was useless because I didn't have enough first aid information. Although one time a disposable diaper made with clean yeah. made nice, a nice direct pressure bandage on a laceration from a skill saw, but we'll uh, talk about that. Yeah, sometime. That's, a, that's probably a, a great, um, <laughs> something for a skill saw wound. There, there's no gauze big enough in no, your, no. In your diapers are that. about right. All right. Thank you, Duke. Next question is from Matthew. Hi, I really enjoy your show. I've been watching it for a couple years. Um, I'm a native Oregonian up from around Salem area, Silverton. But I'm currently living in Florida, but looks like I'll be heading back to Oregon sometime soon once all this crazy coronavirus stuff is over. I was wondering why you don't use a Tico gun for installing your hangers and brackets and straps. Uh, both of the companies I've worked for doing construction have used those, and I found them to be a lot more efficient and faster than hand driving or using a palm nailer. And I've been doing construction for about six years. Look forward to seeing every episode. Really enjoy them. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew, that's great. And uh, hurry back to Oregon. We need we need a few more voices of sanity around here. Um, so for the past 25 years in Oregon, my construction diet has been not predominantly framing, but predominantly additions and remodels and steel structures and a couple little bridges and just a sort of a a wide range of different things. And so Tico nail guns came out and I, I just didn't have enough steady framing going to justify it for a long time. And then I got a nice big shop edition, which had a lot of hardware. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'll go buy a Tico nail gun. And I think I bought a Senko and it was a piece of junk. Hmm. It just jammed and it wouldn't shoot. And I bought 50 pounds of little collated Tico nails. By the way, a Tico nail is a short, like an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half large diameter. I can't give you the diameter um, off the top of my head. It's a framing um, hardware fastening nail. Yeah, it's what it's what is used to fa to attach the Simpson hangers and such to the lumber itself, and they're galvanized and they're they're really they're heavy thick. duty. They have a big shear value and the yeah. resist, yeah, and so and they're they're hard to drive by hand because they're short. It's like driving a roofing nail in awkward positions. Matthew's right; a palm nailer doesn't get in there very well. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, so I bought this gun and it worked great about thirty percent of the time. And I took oh. it back, got my money back, and was stuck with fifty pounds of the nails. And since then. I haven't had a whole bunch. I haven't had enough framing going on, Matthew, to justify the expense and to risk the disappointment. But I can see that they probably work beautifully when you need yeah. one if you got the right gun. Yeah, that's the calculation, isn't it? Is it do I spend the money on the tool or do I limp along without it? And can does it is it going to save me money? And right, that's that is the calculation. Okay, Jimmy. Hey, Nate and Scott. I started a new job about nine months ago, which is fairly entry level. But since then, my job responsibilities has grown quite a bit. So I was wondering, when would be the best time to ask for a raise, and how would I go about doing that? Thank you guys so much. I'm a huge fan of the channel. Okay. So first of all, that's an important question. We've all thought about that. Because the thing about working for somebody, the, the life of a working person, especially a blue-collar person, is that you're trading your life for money. You're trading your time for money, and we have a responsibility to ourselves and to our families to trade it as dearly as we can. If you are not, if you're leaving money on the table every hour, you're not going to live long enough to catch up on what you left behind, right? So you have to keep that as high as you can keep it. It's, but 
you can't just make that calculation based on how much per hour. You got to think about how much per year, because sometimes a job which is less per hour is more hours per month and more more days per year. And so, at year over year, sometimes fewer dollars per hour can translate to a better standard of living, depending on your employer. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But just to answer your question, you don't go to your employer to ask for a raise until you have a landing place if he tells you no. Because if he tells you no, right then, the door on future opportunity there just got shut a long ways. It might not have locked shut. I mean, he might say, well, Jimmy, you know, you're just not, not quite, you know. I mean, what I'm going to need is this and this and this. And okay. And so you can accept that, but your follow-up question ought to be, Okay, so if I learn this and this and this, if I'm producing this and this and this, what could I expect to be paid? Because when you're done with that conversation, you at least need to take away what you can expect, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the other thing is you have to know what you, your um, best possible reasonable expectation, and you have to know what you would settle for. So once you, once you have that, a place to go if the answer is no, what would really make you happy and what you would be willing to accept and what you would have to do to get it to a level where you could accept, now you're ready to go in and talk to him. It's not always the case for everybody in every job, but if you're learning things at your job and yeah. getting value by working there besides your paycheck, and I know that's not every job, but it, sometimes it is. I worked at a job for two years and I learned a lot and when I quit and left, they, they couldn't have paid me enough to stay. They could have offered me a million dollars. I would have said, well, I would have probably said yes then, but for like a month and I would have been gone. <laughs> Point is, if you're still learning things, Jimmy, and you're you're adding to your resume, um, you know, you got to factor that in. If it's 100%, like I am here for the paycheck and if and I'm going to go find another job, then ask them tomorrow. And I yeah. would say highlight, like you're already identifying, the items that you have added to your set of responsibilities and the mm -hmm. value that you've brought. And I, I would guess it'd be, you know, slam dunk if you're, if you're doing that many more things, if you were worth one number when you started with those skills that he assigned, that you were assigned. And now you've got all these new ones. I mean, that, that shouldn't be tough. And number two, I, I, there's a, there is a good thing to see an employee who's assertive. And I, again, not in every case, but I can imagine sometimes where this maybe just see a positive thing to be assertive and show the employer that in addition to these other things, you can be assertive and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. negotiate. It's a negotiation. Mm -hmm. it, it is. And, and if you're really effective, maybe he's got a spot in sales for you. Yeah. I mean, if you can go in there and negotiate a raise from a guy who's not in the habit of giving raises at the end of that, say, Hey, maybe, Maybe you could use me in a completely different part of this company. I don't know. Yeah. I, we did a podcast on negotiation a couple of weeks ago, and it was okay. And it's the, the bottom line of that is it's, it's, you're, you're looking for a win-win a between the two parties, ideally, especially in an employment situation, because you're both going to come back to work you know, the next day. So it needs to be positive. You need to both be gaining something from it, and maybe there's a way to offer, you know, hey, if I also do this and maybe add another thing proactively, if I also add this to my set of responsibilities, you know, I'll lock up at night or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think my I think my paycheck should would be worth about this amount. That's 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 pretty fair. What do you what do you think? You know, mm -hmm. maybe you can maybe you can offer a little more that way. There's there's a lot of um a lot of strength in that. But stay away from ultimatums unless yeah. you've got a way to land on your feet next Monday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I wouldn't want to play hardball with with a employer if that was your only employment option. Oh, and right now, okay, yeah. let's answer this question all over again. Yeah. In an era of COVID and twenty two percent unemployment nationwide, just keep the job you've got, man. Yeah. And when we get to the other side of this, now's the time to start talking about that. I have a feeling there'll be some good feedback in the comments, Jimmy. So hopefully you can yeah. check there. But this is another area where there's probably people who are really good at this and other people who are yeah less assertive and get walked all over their whole career because yep. they never have the the muscle to you know get in there and put their fist on the table and say i'm worth it and yeah and if they did you know in fact i i knew a, a lady who i i can't remember how many years she worked at this job like seven years or something and then come to find out they were paying the new hires more than they were paying her oh man oh man <laughs> and she found out about it and still didn't like 
cause a fuss or anything. She's still just kind of like, well, this or that. And it's just, man, you gotta, you gotta be assertive. You, you, you gotta know when to stand up for yourself. And so, you know, some people are good at that. Others are less good at it. Well, that's all of our questions. Uh, I thought this worked pretty well. You can submit questions on our website at essentialcraftsman.com slash speak pipe. We'll do our best to answer the them the interesting ones if we don't answer it it probably means that we're thinking about it and maybe we will address it in a more serious setting on a video on our main channel or or some other way but thank you everybody who submitted these is there any other any other uh, little items you want to add or put back into this uh, conversation dad um just this the thing about finding mentors and asking for raises don't be impatient when when I look back, I realize there were some times when I just was leaning forward a little too hard. Somet yeah. Sometimes you can just kind of take a deep breath yeah. and realize, you know, darn it, life is not bad. Yeah. Because one of the little cliches that I learned a long time is that life is what happens while you're making other plans. And we can get so fixated on changing some aspect of what's going on that we forget that, man, what have I done with the last week or two or month or two or year or two? So... Yeah, don't sweat a, it too much, boys. That's especially true with younger people. And I was and still am this way, but you once you're an adult and you're no longer a kid, you you see other adults and just kind of instantly feel like you deserve and and are entitled to what other people have. It's really it's really hard to be patient when you're in your twenties. When you're in your twenties, it is hard to be patient and think, well, you know, if a person is, you know, let's say in their thirties, that's that doesn't look that far away, but it's hard to understand those 10 years the person might. So I don't know. Being patient is really an important skill that takes takes practice, and it's, it's, it is important. Yeah. I guess one more thing relative to jobs and stuff, and that is if you can do it, if, if you go in and, and you're wanting to negotiate a raise, that's perfect. But try not to burn the bridge because it's remarkable how many times we all circle back around and end up engaged or in a different relationship with some of the same people, particularly if we stay in the same town, you, you've got to, be, the, the phrase is you've got to be careful what toes you step on on the way up because they could very easily be connected to the rear end you have to kiss while you're on your way down. Yeah. So just be a little careful and play nice. And if the person you're playing with is not playing nice, go play with somebody else. Yeah, that's that's great advice. And again, I, I'll mention it one more time, even though it's redundant. If you're learning new things at your job, that yep. there are there's payment or I don't know what you call that compensation. There, yeah, there's compensation you could that 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 you can be getting that's not monetary. That is so valuable. I've known people. We've all known people who've done internships or taken jobs for yeah. free because they want to learn and and see something. And so. If it's the type of thing where you are learning a lot and you're around people who are, you know, help improving your skill set, don't discount that. There's a lot of jobs that you can work where you're not learning anything and which maybe you'd be making more money, but it's tough to say if that's, you know, if that's a smarter, if that's a good trade. That's great. So, all right, well, we'll sign off there. Thanks for checking. Uh, thanks for listening to our podcast, everybody. We truly appreciate it. And we will catch you next time. 